Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Paranormality Magazine or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not under our control. Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs, and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. Just a little after midnight, one November night in 2007, a pair of mysterious cryptids walked across a family's lawn in Fresno, California. The footage went viral and became an internet sensation. The walking pants became the cute and cuddly face of cryptozoology. They walked across the screen in such a silly and ridiculous fashion that most of us couldn't help but instantly fall in love with the little guys, and that is pretty much where the story concluded. A paranormal reality show here or there would cover the topic, discussion boards would debate the validity of the footage, usually ending in an agreement that at least they were adorable, and the whereabouts of the man who filmed the events was left to mystery. Case closed, right? But what if I told you there was so much more to the story? What if the cuddly and adorable Fresno Nightcrawlers were something so much more complicated and mysterious? Nick Valenzuela went to the actual grounds of the Fresno Nightcrawlers incident and spoke to the family who experienced the ordeal. Here's the story that he tells. I drive into Fresno on a blistering 100-degree day in June. The sun is scorching Highway 99 as I roll into town. The town is alive and bustling on a Saturday afternoon and is in full swing of summer fun. My purpose is to uncover some truth about a dark and cold night back in November of 2007. I pull up to a normal-looking house in what looks like a typical California neighborhood. In the driveway awaiting me is a man named Rogelio, brother to Jose, who originally filmed the Nightcrawler footage. Jose, unfortunately, passed away in 2014. However, Rogelio was there for every part of the Nightcrawler saga. He and his brother experienced this together, and it was one part of a powerful bond the two brothers shared. Rogelio keeps a picture of himself alongside his brother as his phone screensaver. I meet Rogelio on the same lawn that two mysterious beings traversed 15 years ago. Rogelio is about to tell me about that night, and so much more. Jose lived with his family in the heart of Fresno. Their neighborhood of residents had a bicycle thief in their midst, so Jose decided to install a surveillance system. One camera was set up to directly overlook the front yard of their house. One night, the family dog began barking to an extreme degree. Jose turned on the monitor linked to the surveillance system. Jose grabbed his camcorder to record the monitor in the hopes of catching whatever caused the dog to go off. Jose witnessed two beings walk across his lawn. These entities are now infamous in their description, almost all leg with a small stump head. They walk in a very uncanny valley type of manner that comes off as clumsy and awkward. The beings pass a small tree as they make their way across the lawn. In comparison to this tree, the beings should be roughly about two feet tall. In shock, Jose called out to Rogelio and showed him the footage. Both were in astonishment of what they witnessed. The first being walks by and appears to look up at the camera. Rogelio stated that in the original footage from his brother's camera, you could tell the being had large, solid black eyes. This detail will come back into play later. Both beings seem to be wearing little capes or have loose skin around the bottom of their legs. The two brothers stepped outside onto their lawn and looked around for any sign of the creatures. They were only met with the cold air of the night and an unnerving feeling that they witnessed something beyond comprehension. 
However, according to Rogelio, Jose felt something else. Utter fear. The next morning, Jose and Rogelio discuss what happened. Both come to the agreement that this is not a prank. I asked Rogelio if there was any reason as to why someone would prank his family. Rogelio was adamant that his family got along with the entire neighborhood except for one particular family. When I inquire about the possibility of a prank from that family, Rogelio gives a very direct answer. They wouldn't have played a prank. They would have most likely did a drive-by if they were upset. While Rogelio and Jose were in agreement that the footage was not a prank, the two differed on what to do with the footage. Rogelio felt that they should just let it be and see what happens. Jose, on the other hand, wanted everyone to see the footage. He felt compelled to share it with as many people as possible. Jose contacted the local Univision news station, and they had Jose come down to the TV station. As Jose showed the footage to a reporter, she requested that her cameraman get the footage as quickly as possible so that they could have footage ready for air that day. He then proceeded to film Jose's footage from a TV monitor with his camera. To recap, the quality of the footage that would introduce the world to the Nightcrawlers was as follows. Step 1. Consumer-grade night vision camera hooked up to a CCTV system, which films the Nightcrawlers. Step 2. Camcorder recording of the CCTV system monitor, recording footage of Nightcrawlers from the TV monitor. Step 3. Camcorder footage played on TV monitor at Univision, which is filmed by another camera. This is the footage that airs on Univision and a copy is made for an investigator named Victor Camacho by Jose. Step 4. Victor Camacho presents footage at MUFON conference and the projection screen showing the Nightcrawler footage is videotaped by an audience member from another camcorder. This is the footage that originally goes viral. The empirical evidence is a copy of a copy of a copy. This is the quality of footage that is most analyzed. The footage was featured the very next day on the Primer Impacto show. The segment seemed to generate a lot of speculation, so Univision wanted an expert source on the case. They contacted Victor Camacho, who hosted a very popular Spanish radio talk show on topics of high strangeness called Los Desvelados. Victor made the drive from Los Angeles to Fresno and examined the footage in person. I spoke with Victor Camacho to get his opinion on the infamous case. Question. What was your initial reaction to the Nightcrawler footage? Answer. I was pretty convinced, but I really wanted to talk to Jose about the case and I really wanted to go to the house. But when I talked to Jose at the TV station, he was extremely nervous and scared. This event had only happened to him two days prior. He didn't want me to go to the house out of what seemed like fear of the situation. So I respected that and didn't want to pressure him into doing anything he didn't want to do. Question. When did you eventually get to investigate the house? Answer. I initially met Jose and did the Univision story in November of 2007. Jose called me in March of 2008 and invited me over to the house to allow me to investigate further. I met with Jose and his family, and he let me check out the property and interview family and neighbors. Question. Did you inspect the video equipment? Answer. He let me check out the video system and the old camcorder he used to film the monitor. He told me he put up the night vision camera outside because somebody was stealing bicycles in the neighborhood, and this was the system he saw the nightcrawlers on. But the thing with that CCTV system was that as soon as he would rewind the surveillance tape, he would lose the recording. That's why he recorded the footage with his camcorder, and that original tape didn't keep the footage. Question. Do you remember the early reactions from the general paranormal audience of what was on the video? Answer. I presented the video before anyone was using the term Nightcrawler. My opinion back then is the same as it is now. I mentioned that these beings were mantis-like in their appearance. That has generally been the opinion I have given about this case. In my early presentations, many people did agree with me about the mantis appearance on this particular case perhaps some kind of insectoid. At the very beginning of the video, you can somewhat make out a bright light that appears just before the beings walk into frame. I'm not sure if this is a floodlight going off or perhaps something paranormal in nature. Question. Did you see the footage taken near Yosemite National Park, and do you think it relates to the Fresno case? Answer. I think the video from Yosemite is a fake. It's honestly totally different from what Jose recorded at the house. 
The Fresno beings had what looks like a cape, and when they moved, the cape would move as well. Very hard to fake. The Yosemite beings are just big legs moving. Question. In all of your years being associated with the case, has anyone ever reported a similar incident to you with Nightcrawler beings? Answer. No. Not exactly the same mantis or insectoid-like beings that Jose reported. But I have gotten some reports that are more in line with what the Nightcrawlers are classified as now. Long legs with a tiny head. The only ever video footage I have had a chance to inspect was from Peru, but it was clearly the branches of a tree moving due to the wind. I did receive a report from Mexico that was compelling and another report from Canada that included a drawing. These are the only other reports of potential Nightcrawlers that I have received. Here is a report from Canada that was sent to Victor by a man named Chris. He said, Me and my friend encountered a Fresno Nightcrawler in 2010 in Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada. Entered my friend's backyard five-acre forest at night close to 1 a.m. in the northwest rural part of my city and both of us immediately saw something out of place down the path below about 30 to 40 feet away from us in between the trees that was tall, white, and three-dimensional. It appeared to be completely white and soft like light, but it did not illuminate the trees or ground around it. There was no face or any facial features we could see, no arms, and it was shaped in an upside-down V or U. It was making creepy swaying movements with its whole body, two legs left to right, back and forth, silently still standing on the forest floor in the exact same spot the whole time we saw it. It was so white that you could see the shadow being cast on it while it was swaying like it was a real animal. It did not pick up its legs or walk at all. I can only explain it as looking like seven to eight foot really white, soft, shiny, separated curtains in the shape of an upside-down V or U with bulkiness or shape to the top, the two long legs or arms looked like the frontal view an ape's forearms would look like when they are crawling on all fours, as if the two long legs were hunched in front. It was moving left to right in a specific motion standing on the forest floor in the same area between the trees, making absolutely no sound. And there was absolutely no wind. It was beautiful to look at, but terrifying at the same time. We watched it in silence as it was swaying, and I started to feel impending doom the sinking feeling in your chest set in, and it felt like I was going to die or something bad was going to happen. I told my friend specifically, I don't like this. He agreed, and we immediately left the forest. I recently showed First Nations where I live, and my friends experienced, and the sketch that we sent, they said it was a double-headed serpent. In the research I've been doing, these creatures correlate with the Quetzalcoatl. They go by various different names from different First Nation cultures in Pacific Northwest Canada. End of the report. After the Univision coverage, the story became a viral sensation. Soon, the case was featured on Sci-Fi's Fact or Faked TV show, and the name Fresno Nightcrawlers took off from there. Another video from outside of Yosemite National Park, roughly an hour from Fresno, appeared online, and all of a sudden the Fresno area seemed to be like a nightcrawler hotspot or window area. I felt that I needed to do my due diligence on getting to the bottom of the significance of the Nightcrawlers in terms of their significance to Fresno. I reached out to Michael Banting, who runs the website Weird Fresno for his opinion on the case and the lasting legacy of the walking pants. Here's the interview with him. Question: When did you first encounter the Fresno Nightcrawler story? Answer: I first came across the video in September of 2008. I had just started writing for Weird Fresno, and it was one of the very first things I wrote about. Question. What do you make of the video? Answer. The Fresno video, I believe, is real, meaning that whatever was filmed is not a hoax or a fake. Whatever they are, I cannot tell you. Sadly, the quality is so bad, as this is a recording from a projection onto a screen at a conference, and that video was a copy of the original CCTV footage, which wasn't very high quality to begin with. As for the Yosemite video, I believe that one is a hoax, and for several reasons. One, the footage is said to be recorded by a paranormal investigator, but when I went to contact them, I noticed this video was the only thing on their channel. I attempted to contact them several times with no luck, and there was never any other activity on that channel except for the Yosemite footage. Also, the movement is different than the Fresno footage, and it feels like someone was trying to recreate that. Question. 
do you think the Fresno area is a window area, given that there was another sighting near Yosemite National Park roughly an hour from town? Answer. Despite my opinion on the Yosemite footage, I do believe this area is a thin area. Fresno itself is a bit of a liminal place, but there's a lot of weird things that have happened here over the years. Question. In your opinion, are the entities in the video a peek at the other, or is there a more natural explanation available? Answer. I wish I knew what these were. I honestly think something slipped through and we got a peek at something maybe ultra-terrestrial. I've said it before, and for some reason they remind me of the Fey folk. Question. Why do you think these beings have such a lasting legacy in pop culture? How has that impacted Fresno? Answer. I think their cuteness is what has allowed them to last so long. Do a quick Etsy search and you'll see all types of merchandise like stickers and plushies of the Nightcrawler. But the weird thing is most of these are made from people outside of Fresno, though I have noticed recently that more and more are being made by locals. Question. Is this the strangest story to come out of Fresno? Answer. I'd say yes. I've written about a lot of things over the last 10 plus years, but this one was one of the first I wrote about and has lasted all that time. People still ask me what it is, and I still have the same answer. I don't know. I don't think we will ever know. This was a one-time thing, but its legacy is definitely lasting. End of interview. Back under the scorching Fresno sun, Rogelio finishes telling me about his experience with the Nightcrawlers. But that's not the end of the story. Actually, the story is really just beginning. I don't know when this house was built, and I don't know the history, but weird things have always happened here ever since we moved in, Rogelio said. The next story Rogelio shared with me completely dropped my jaw and honestly changed my entire view of the Nightcrawlers and the potential situation surrounding this case. Rogelio mentions how their house has had issues with troublemaking kids. However, these kids just appear at times in the house can't always see them, but he and his family can oftentimes hear them moving throughout the house. When asked to expand upon this, Rogelio tells me about a time his brother Jose could feel them in his room. Jose said out loud for whatever was in his room to show itself. Jose then witnessed a child's face appear in his closet. The face was pale white with solid black eyes. Rogelio says the kids never go to sleep. They are felt in the house at various times throughout the day. The family has witnessed a baby crawling on their floor, a girl entity that hides behind furniture, almost resembling a game of peekaboo, constant pitter-patter footsteps, and a heavy feeling of being watched in the house. Rogelio makes it known that many of his family members cannot sleep with the lights off, and they're afraid to investigate further to make the activity worse. But what he says next is really odd. They are our friends now. We let them know they can stay and just not to spook us anymore. What's being described sounds eerily similar to the black-eyed kids, BEK for short, phenomenon, with slight variations. Reports of BEKs usually revolve around a child or children appearing at a doorstep asking for permission to be let into the home or premises, and the experiencer becomes overwhelmed with complete and utter fear. This situation does not involve the classic BEK encounter, but if you pay attention closely, it has all the hallmarks of a BEK case. A child with solid black eyes did make an appearance. Jose and the family admitted to feeling absolutely terrified, and the family eventually did give the entities permission to stay at the house, seemingly the BEK's goal. One aspect of this case that has been consistent, from Rogelio Victor Camacho, and even interviews with Jose before his passing, was that Jose was terrified of the Nightcrawlers. It's been mentioned time and time again that he began to fear even leaving the house. For creatures that the general public finds adorable, this is a very curious reaction. One of the main check marks in BEK cases is the immense fear the experiencer is overcome with when confronted by these entities. What if the Nightcrawlers were not exactly cute walking pants cryptids, but an unformed putty or the other carrying out an agenda more closely related to BEKs? I know this is a bit of a jump for those who may be into a more conventional analysis of anomalous phenomenon, 
However, we're discussing walking pants monsters and humanoid children. Conventional analysis may have no grounds here. And there's one more thing to analyze. I want to make this statement respectfully, and I bring it up only in terms of analysis of the case. There is strong lore that giving BEKs permission to enter a household can bring about harm or death. Jose did, unfortunately, pass away after this incident. It has been noted that some visual depictions of Azrael, the angel of death, features the being with solid black eyes. Rogelio and Victor Camacho both pointed out that the first Nightcrawler seen on camera had solid black eyes. The Nightcrawler's size matches the haunting reports of children in the household. Perhaps these visions of children were harbingers or omens in some way. Rogelio noted that after Jose's passing, the activity did fade drastically, but not entirely. There does seem to be grounds here for an overlapping phenomenon with perhaps more sinister intentions. By no means am I suggesting all anomalous phenomenon is negative in nature, however, it's difficult to spin BEK reports in a positive light. So the final question is what exactly did show up on the camera that November evening in 2007? What were those beings exactly, and why are there so few reports of anything similar? I believe it all depends on the context in which you view incidents of high strangeness. Maybe these beings really are just undiscovered creatures out for a late-night stroll in Fresno and just happened to walk by a house with a surveillance system. But the context in which Jose and his family experienced this event seems too direct and intentional to be a mere cryptozoological coincidence. These anomalous events seem to have a reflective nature to the experiencer. More and more it seems these anomalous beings witnessed are an allegory for the message that they're trying to impart on the experiencer. Whether that's in the form of a ghost, an alien gray, Bigfoot, or even a BEK, perhaps it is all a mask from some unknown intelligence choosing what to show us, but what happens when we choose to see the other side? I had to reach out to my friends in the magic community to shed some light on this practice. I'm exposed to the idea of triangles of practice from the Goetia. Goetic triangles of art are key in the summation of Salmonic magic. Occultists have often pontificated on the idea of triangle UFOs essentially being magic entry points having the ability to appear in our reality and essentially being a gateway from another world, realm, or plane of existence. Usually the triangle object is seen in the sky and then anomalous activity ensues. And then it hit me, the nightcrawlers are essentially walking triangles. We focus on the legs and stumpy head, but look at the shape formed in the outline of these entities. They form a triangle. Perhaps the nightcrawlers were a peek at the other in the form needed to manifest in our reality. I think back to when Victor Camacho made the statement of arguably seeing a flash before the Nightcrawlers appear. Could these beings have flashed into our reality only to take on the form of a BEK later for Jose and as ghost children for the remainder of the family? What I do know to be true is this case is so much stranger than I ever imagined. I was fortunate enough to get the full incident from the people who experienced it and lived through the ordeal. The camcorder Jose used to film the Nightcrawlers from that November 2007 night is now in possession of Paranormality magazine. Possible proof of the anomalous was just sitting in a home in Fresno, unexamined by the world. The issue is the tape seemed to be jammed in the camcorder, and Rogelio fears removing it may damage it forever. Skeptics would say this is once again a convenient issue to stop any real analysis of the original footage. However, there is nothing new in the grand scheme of the paranormal. In George P. Hansen's The Trickster and the Paranormal, the idea of the phenomenon negating itself is discussed. Seemingly all empirical paranormal evidence seems to always end up vanishing or destroyed somehow. Take for example the original Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot film, which is missing. The Sandra Mancy negative photo of Champ the Lake Monster, which was thrown away. And now the original Nightcrawler footage, trapped in a camcorder and possibly damaged. But what I do feel is truth is that Jose and his family did not fake this incident. One of the most popular theories facing the Nightcrawlers is that the video is an elaborate hoax, 
yet explaining how it was accomplished seems to lack any concrete answer. Heck, a famous TV show with a decent budget couldn't recreate the footage. Getting the opportunity to talk to the family in person opened my eyes to just how frightened they were and how little they wanted to do with anything potentially paranormal. With Rogelio's statement of the fear of a drive-by, the likelihood of a prank being performed in this neighborhood after midnight also seems unlikely and potentially dangerous to the prankster. I think something truly anomalous walked across this lawn in Fresno, California. The goal and objective of the beings may have potentially been sinister. The full anecdotal account has now been told, and the empirical evidence sits dormant, waiting for a day to be examined. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. In 2011, Piero Scaruffi wrote, A new view of nature is emerging, which encompasses both galaxies and neurons, gravitation and life, molecules and emotions. As a culmination of centuries of studying nature, mankind has been approaching the thorniest subject of all, ourselves. As cited in Atwater. Only recently have we begun to identify and appreciate that the human body is more alive in an invisible dimension than we have historically thought. In previous articles discussing stone tape and water tape theories, we discussed some of the weird sciences of modern times and their paranormal implications, including the notion that we may be but a soul inhabiting a human form, not a human form containing a soul. We know that a biofield of electromagnetic energy vibrates both inside us on a molecular level and simultaneously outside of us in a toroidal harmonic wave that directly impacts and corresponds to the immediate environment. We discussed that hauntings, disembodied voices, footsteps, apparitions may just be recordings of previous occurrences embedded in the very environment in which death or intense emotional projection occurred. These are residual hauntings, unaware of the living, not unlike a fossil that remains buried in the fabric of the environment and only exposed when the moment is right. But what happens to the rest of us after our biological matter disintegrates, our energetic light forms sucked into the environment? What happens to our consciousness, our personality, our selves? Let's explore the biophotonic properties of our DNA the historical influences of technology on our understanding of soul and physiological and psychosomatic responses to experiencing a paranormal encounter. Let's delve into a kind of spiritual alchemy, defined by Merriam-Webster as a change of some essential element into a superior form. Rather than use new science to extract precious metals, we use new science to study the relationship between our consciousness and matter also known as the science of the soul. For our purposes here, we'll use the word soul and consciousness interchangeably. Diana Palsuka, professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, discusses the biophotonic and phononic particles inherent in our DNA in her 2019 book, American Cosmic, UFOs, Religion, and Technology. We'll place a link to that in the show notes. 
The natural frequency of our DNA is similar to a biological Internet, whose data is stored within light photons and functions like fiber-optic wiring. When stretched out and uncoiled in laboratory settings, a single strand of DNA can be up to six feet long and has its own natural frequency around 150 megahertz. Further research by Dr. Sasumno Ono of the Beckman Research Institute in California and French anthropologist Jeremy Narby also concluded that DNA emits and receives both light waves and sound waves. DNA molecules of different bodily areas had their own musical melody, wrote Dr. P.M.H. Atwater in her groundbreaking research on near-death experiences. She continued, Our bodies are made of light and sound at the most primal level, and so are the worlds of spirit and the structures of matter. Life and death are coded in the language of light and sound. DNA just got a whole lot more interesting and mysterious. It is a coiled, vibrating antenna with its own electric generator that communicates directly with the body, the environment, and the universe. It is its own technology. It has everything it needs to participate in its own creation and evolution. Sounds a lot like something a consciousness would be capable of, doesn't it? Our historic views on how the body and soul operate were, and still are, modeled after the technology available to us at the time. Ancient Roman physicians suggested our souls flowed through our bodies like the aqueducts or bathhouse heating systems common during that time. Philosopher René Descartes envisioned the soul flowing through our nervous system via a series of strings and valves, not unlike the pipe organ, a popular musical instrument during the 16th century. Fast forward to the late 20th century when film director Nigel Neal coined the phrase stone tape theory in 1972 to describe how spirit energies are recorded into the environment. In today's world, we use digital technologies as a metaphor for our consciousness, like, I don't have the bandwidth to take on another project right now. Nowadays, we have the option of uploading data to cloud-based storage, meaning our digital data exists on servers through an off-site third-party location. Perhaps our brains act like a TV antenna or wireless router which receives electromagnetic signals and transfers them into image and sound. Our brain can only pick up one signal, one channel, at a time. Said best by science journalist Mary Roach in her New York Times best-selling book, Spook, Science Tackles the Afterlife, which I'll also link to in the show notes, we can't watch HBO if we're already watching Bravo but that doesn't mean HBO's broadcast ceases to exist. If our mental model of consciousness continues to match the technology of the time, is it too far out to imagine that our consciousness may exist somewhere outside of our own personal hard drive at a third-party location, and that our thoughts and ideas are merely downloads? In her book, Mary Roach said, I've often wondered whether the inventors of computers created them in their own image of how their minds worked or if they related the machine to the mind after the machines were created, quoting computer programmer Benny Pincus, as cited by Mary Roach in 2011. Indeed, it begs speculation that the very core of our consciousness is like a computer operating system, and the energy within the environment is a system of nothing more than data waiting to be downloaded into a correct interpretation. Furthermore, if that biological Internet within our very own DNA is operated by an outside consciousness, it implies that consciousness does not exclusively belong to us. If anything, we belong to and participate in it, writes researcher Patrick Harper in Daemonic Reality, A Field Guide to the Underworld, another book I'll place in the show notes. So to recap, the concept of our consciousness existing outside the body is rather new and corresponds with our current lexicon of a digital age, like uploading data to cloud-based storage. We employ the technology of the time to further explain not only the fabric of our outside reality, but a shared consciousness amongst ourselves, and that active metacognition can help us collectively theorize that which is paranormal in nature, that which frightens and intrigues us, that which we can't explain. Consider the case of medical engineering designer Vic Tandy. In the mid-1990s, Tandy started experiencing something unsettling, spooky paranormal activity, according to him, in his studio laboratory. He sensed an ongoing level of discomfort, 
a distinct chill while working in his lab, and he even witnessed a silent, grayish figure slip by his periphery. In a separate instance, he noticed a foil blade in the lab vibrating back and forth as it was receiving energy from an unknown source. Being the scientist that he was, he calculated that the vibrating blade had been varying in intensity at a rate equal to the resonant frequency of the blade. In other words, an invisible sound wave was causing the movement. He said, I was sharing the lab with a low-frequency standing wave, he exclaimed in his article for the Journal for the Society of Psychical Research. This wave had manifested at the precise frequency to be completely reflected back by the structure of the lab. Tandy investigated the phenomenon further, finding the same presence of infrasound, sometimes up to 200 times higher frequencies, in several reportedly haunted locations across Germany and England. The effects of infrasound on the human body have also been scientifically studied in controlled conditions. Low-frequency vibrations, between 12 and 27 hertz, have been shown to cause short-lived visual disturbances, perspiration, even heart palpitations. Frequencies closer to 18 hertz could even vibrate the eyeball, causing vision to be smeared or create sensory phenomena suggestive of a ghost in one's periphery. We've all seen an opera singer shatter glass, and it's not considered paranormal. The singer is literally manipulating energy on a quantum level to create a very real outcome. Had Vic Tandy not been a scientist, would he have continued to describe the initial presence of the waveform and its related visual disturbances as a ghost? Perhaps we should take note as paranormal investigators that the majority of hauntings may be residual in nature, and rather than projecting a personality onto a phenomenon, that is, calling it a demon or a trapped spirit, we should assume its original consciousness exists elsewhere and is undeterred by the earth-based drama that was human nature. What if we removed philosophy, psychology, and theology from the phenomenon and just appreciated the phenomenon for what it is, like Vic Tandy did with the mysterious waveform that manifested in his studio? Humans are, in essence, made up of the same stuff as the paranormal phenomenon many of us have encountered. Some of us are sensitive enough to pick up on the electromagnetic energies and photons in the environment, while certain environments seem to discharge that pent-up energy at random. Does that power lie within our DNA? Indeed, the thorny subject of studying ourselves in the presence of the phenomenon is a daunting and mysterious task. But as we've seen, such knowledge of ourselves with a little spiritual alchemy added in will help us find the answer to the age-old question of what happens when we die. But are we ready for it? Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Dot com, or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.